So I'm going to welcome Ross Trevers to our conference today and uh, tell him I'm very glad that he's here. Good okay. friend of mine, a generous man, and way knowledgeable about agriculture and horticulture in Newfoundland and Labrador. Welcome, Ross. Thank you, Dan. What would you like to tell us about the history of agriculture in our province, uh, the story of how we got to where we're to right now? Okay. Uh, we really need to know a little bit about the history of Newfoundland and, and why we're here and where our ancestors came from and why we came to Newfoundland because uh, the, although there was native people here, uh, they, uh, to my knowledge, weren't involved in any uh, scale of uh, agriculture. So Ross, tell me, where did this all start? For? Well, of course, the first European settlers uh, uh, came uh, not for agriculture, uh, for obvious reasons, but for uh, fishing. And, and, and the main uh, fish was cod. And cod has an amazing ability uh, to uh, be preserved in salt and keep for a long time. Mm -hmm. It uh, can also be preserved by freeze drying. Well, it started with the early settlers, the people that stayed there, uh, or even uh, during the summer uh, when they were just there as a temporary fishing stations. Uh, there was some activity uh, out of necessity to grow uh, vegetables and probably raise some livestock like chickens or a pig or whatever. But the, uh, then as the population grew, there was a need uh, for uh, a necessity, actually, for fresh fruit and vegetables. So what were some of the earliest crops that they grew here? Well, of course, the earliest crops were wild crops, uh, berries, fruit, and, uh, like blueberries and parish berries and that sort of thing. But the, um, uh, the cultivation uh, of the crops were crops that were familiar with the Europeans that settled. Uh, primarily from England and Ireland, Scotland, and uh, and of course uh, from uh, the, on the French shore there was the uh, French uh, who grew crops as well. So what what would they have been growing back in the, like the 1600s? And... Well, potatoes. Uh, for, well, I can say one thing: potatoes wasn't introduced then. And potatoes was not grown because it wasn't introduced even to Europe in the 1600s. It was, it was later. It took 300 years for people to learn they could eat potatoes after they were first yes. brought over. Yeah. So um, uh, it was uh, uh, root crops like uh, parsnip and carrot and, and uh, turnip, and uh, also uh, crops like uh, 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 some grain crops, probably. But the most important thing was uh, was to grow crops that uh, could be uh, used directly uh, right away, or uh, could be stored for a long. Uh, it was it was a, a subsistence type of agriculture. Yeah. The uh, uh, then things uh, changed when as the transportation improved as. Uh, there were more and more people coming to for the fishery, uh, more and more people staying permanently, and then uh, there was uh, a lot of activity with regard to uh, uh, commercial agriculture that started with uh, around the St. John's area and on the west coast, over on uh, the Codrai Valley, these things. Mm. Major activity was the fishery. Mm. The fishery, and the other interesting thing is that uh, when it came to growing crops, uh, there was there was um, it was necessary necessary to uh, have a, a source of nutrients and. The nutrients from the sea were 
readily available. Mm -hmm. uh, Capelin uh, as a source of fertilizer. There was also uh, seaweed, kelp, an excellent source of uh, fertilizer and also neutralized the acidity of the soil which enabled people to grow cr crops much better than uh, they had before. So you mentioned that people weren't growing potatoes much in the earliest days. Yes. Because they weren't really known even in Europe. That's right. Even though they've been brought well, over by... Uh, well, in the 1500s, the Spanish brought them to uh, Spain, uh, so the story goes. And, uh, yeah. and then they had to order people to, uh, to grow them. The, the king had to order people to grow them in order to uh, uh, introduce them to the diet. Anyway, so what were people growing here back in those early fishing well, days? Well, they were growing, uh, like I say, root crops like carrot and, and uh, uh, parsnip and uh, turnip mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, some grain crops and, of course, uh, leafy vegetable crops. Cabbage was uh, uh, another crop that was, uh, could be stored for a relatively long period of time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so these were um, crops that were important for the diet. Were root cellars a tradition that was brought over from Europe, or is it a, a local, the local invention? What do you think about that? Uh, the uh, root cellars. Root cellar. Oh yes. Well, the root cellar was, of course, was quite common in in uh, in Ireland and Scotland and that anyway. Mm -hmm. And so the technology actually was uh, uh, for growing uh, was already uh, in practice in. Uh, in uh, countries like that, so uh, it was, uh, and uh, because the, of in many cases where the fishing uh, fishing activity was taking place in many communities, there was uh, very shallow soils, if any, and 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 very uh, 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 not very um, easily to grow vegetables, but. The, the old uh, lazy bed system or the bed system of growing uh, vegetables and it was well adapted when potatoes was introduced it was re uh, relatively easy to grow. So what's a lazy bed? It's a, a system of cultivation of the soil where uh, there is a, a, probably a three or four foot bed made with a, 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 a trench or ditch on each side of these beds and then the soil from that trench was put on top of the bed to increase the volume of soil mm -hmm. and also used to cover the, the, the material, like, uh, fertilizing material like uh, kelp or uh, capelin mm -hmm. or fish offal. Mm -hmm. So that system was in widespread use all across uh, in most of the areas in, uh, where there was uh, very shallow soils. And so once the railway came in, how did that change the pattern of, of well, cultivation? Okay. Uh, then uh, things changed a lot uh, when the railway opened up uh, the interior. And so it opened up uh, areas uh, with, with access to markets and so commercial uh, agriculture started uh, to flourish in places like the Cadre Valley and and uh, and uh, central Newfoundland and and other areas that uh, weren't uh, accessible before, uh, because the workers for the railway were paid in, in cash, mm -hmm. and not like in the old system where they were. It was a, a truck system where the uh, it was just kept. Uh, your payment was kept as a record on your books, mm -hmm. but. With the uh, introduction of the cash system, of course, then people had uh, uh, money to, to buy. If they didn't grow their own vegetables, they, they could buy them. Yeah. And so that was a major uh, change in the, in the whole economy of, uh, of Newfoundland. So uh, you've asked me to come back, Ross, to tell, so you could tell us another part of the story. And, and what is that? Well, uh, when we were talking, I completely forgot about uh, a major effort on the part of uh, the Commission of Government, which was during the 30s, during the Great Depression, when uh, the Commission of Government uh, established a number of farming 
communities, really. Uh, a lot of them were not uh, lived, the area wasn't lived in before, but uh, the first one was Markland, which there's still some farming activity in that area. Uh, then there was Winterland, still a bit of farming, but uh, uh, a very small scale. Then, then there was uh, uh, Sandringham, and five or six more communities around the province. On the west coast, there was uh, uh, Lourdes on the Port of Port Peninsula, and uh, th this was these communities were farming communities were established to get people from uh, other areas to start farming activities. Of course, during the Depression, there was a lot of people that were out of work and that sort of thing, and this was an attempt to establish uh, some farming communities. Uh, the farms were small, relatively small, uh, mostly vegetable uh, production, uh, although some livestock as well. But uh, uh, the economic conditions changed. Uh, the younger people uh, got good paying jobs with the base and with uh, uh, other economic activities like in Marystown when Marystown started a shipyard and that sort of thing where well, a lot of the people went to work there. And when did chemical fertilizers start coming in? Now, was that after the Second World War or even before? Uh, it, was, uh, it was around the uh, early 1900s that uh, uh, commercial fertilizer, but uh, that's uh, let's uh, back up a bit because mm, sure. uh, the the railway w was a major a major breakthrough. And there are several highlights uh, in in the history of Newfoundland that changed the face of agriculture. Uh, one was the uh, the railway. Uh, the other was the uh, when the American bases started. In, uh, uh, were established in Newfoundland after the, or during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, that introduced uh, a new boost to the economy. Mm -hmm. And so there was, uh, there, was lot, uh, there was more money than available for people to purchase things mm -hmm. like, uh, like food. So, uh, but uh, the other, the, the next big change, of course, was after Confederation, after we joined Canada. Then there was money for infrastructure and the roads were, transportation was improved, roads were established, Trans-Canada was built, and then uh, the ferry system was improved so that uh, agricultural products could come very easily into Newfoundland and be distributed to every community. So you had a, a, a major influence there with the improvement in transportation because, and if you look at the, the situation right now, uh, you can uh, get a truckload of produce from California within five to ten days mm -hmm. uh, into Newfoundland. So a major, uh, that's a major uh, influence on the economics of growing in Newfoundland where it is in, in many cases more expensive than it would be elsewhere. The modern days of uh, ways of uh, preserving food, preserving fresh produce, mm -hmm. preserving meat. Mm -hmm. For example, you can uh, you can get lamb from New Zealand now that's not frozen. And, it, and the shelf life, I'm told, is, uh, is over um, a month. The, the whole economics of, of production has, has ch changed. Uh, when I first started uh, work with agriculture, uh, there was many, many small farms growing vegetables. I say relatively small farms, you know, mm -hmm. 10 acres, 20 acres, mm -hmm. and that now, well, now 
most of these producers are getting older or have retired and so uh, the economics of someone taking it over and making money is not there anymore. Hmm. They're not going to you're not going to get uh, uh, a lot of young people to work like their fathers worked. There's an old, there was a Royal Commission done in 1955 after Confederation, and one of the famous statements in the Royal Commission on what they call small-scale agriculture was that they are born of adversity and died with prosperity. Mm -hmm. So that was um, uh, summing it up in a very, a very few words. The uh, uh, one thing about any type of agricultural activity is that it's a very rewarding hobby. Very rewarding hobby, uh, but sometimes, uh, of course, it can be. Uh, you don't make any money at it, but it's the fact that you can raise your own food and the satisfaction of raising your own food hmm. and the satisfaction of, of uh, being uh, you, that you grew it yourself mm -hmm. is, uh, is a very motivating force. There certainly has been a rebirth, a resurgence of people interested in growing their own food, uh, both in your own, their own backyards, but also on small farms, sometimes run by young families. That's what I've been discovering as we've poked around across the province. Right. Yeah. And it's because it's, a, it's such a motivating force that uh, uh, people want to do that. Now, there are uh, exceptions, of course, where, uh, like most things, there are exceptions where um, it is economical to do things. The, uh, the other thing that uh, has changed in, in uh, Newfoundland since Confederation and, uh, and, and joining Canada is that uh, there, for some of the commodities like eggs and poultry and dairy, mm -hmm. they have come under a scheme where uh, there are uh, the farmers are guaranteed an income mm -hmm. because with a quota system, uh, then uh, that uh, the quota itself becomes a commodity. Yeah. So. Uh, so what do you think in your experience? Because you've run run a nursery for many years. What well, what what's new? What lies ahead? It's uh, uh, highly motivating. Very uh, very rewarding to be able to grow your own food. Probably not economical in in many cases, mm -hmm. but it uh, it gives you the satisfaction that you can grow your own food. It's not going to solve the the, the food security problem, uh, producing mm -hmm. your own food here, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, of the 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 quantities that you need to mm -hmm. provide food security. Mm -hmm. But it. It is a backup. Another important event that occurred in Newfoundland and it affected agriculture, especially on the West Coast, was the building of uh, two major newsprint mills, uh, what we call woods camps or uh, accommodation for the loggers in uh, the areas where they were cutting uh, food for the workers. And as a result, uh, there were cellars built to store the vegetables during the winter. There was also pigs kept to eat the scraps. And there was, uh, 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 like I say, a tremendous demand for vegetables. And so with, the rail uh, with that in combination with the railway, uh, the Agricultural activity on the West Coast, especially in the Cotterai Valley, was mm -hmm. in its heyday. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of activity in, in, in farming and relatively large scale farming mm -hmm. in the Cotterai Valley, which uh, had, was blessed with uh, very good soil resources. Mm -hmm. And so then the, uh, the, the produce would be shipped by rail transported to the woods camps and stored for the winter. 
So the farmers didn't have to uh, store a lot of their produce that was sold in the, in the fall. Okay, I should mention a little bit about uh, the agricultural activity in uh, Labrador. Uh, the Moravian missionaries were a major influence in, uh, in what little agricultural activity was uh, occurring in Labrador in the early days. And they uh, built uh, like um, coal frames and, and other structures to lengthen the growing season in even right in northern Labrador up in, as far as Nain. Mm -hmm. Then came the uh, uh, American base in, in Goose Bay and uh, of course, the Americans uh, were used to a different diet than uh, than most of the native Newfoundlanders, and, uh, and we uh, didn't uh, weren't salads weren't a big popular thing in Newfoundland. But they wanted their salads, and so uh, one of the interesting stories is that uh, uh, they actually employed a, a professor from the University of Guelph uh, who came uh, to Newfoundland, or to Goose Bay, and set up an hydroponic system uh, to grow salad greens in the, in the, back in the 40s, using uh, a sand culture, hydroponics, sort of a hydroponic system in, uh, in Goose Bay. This is uh, back in the, in the 40s. Uh, they harvested you know, wild berries, uh, bake apple being the uh, most important one. Uh, the bake apple uh, uh, or cloudberry as it's called uh, in the Scandinavian translation. Uh, but uh, bake apple is a northern source of vitamin C, uh, very high in vitamin C. And so for the native people, it was always a major source. It was one of the few sources of vitamin C. Some of the, the, the women who went along on the coast and that would, uh, would harvest bake apples. And I've, I've got a jar of, uh, that was used by the merchants in, in uh, St. John's to send the jars up to Labrador on the schooners and harvest the bake apples uh, and ship them back to Newfoundland. Uh, the growing conditions are much better than in many of the coastal communities on the coast. If you look at it in terms of degree days, uh, Goose Bay got close to 18 under 2,000 degree days, whereas on the coast it's down around 1,000 or so. So thank you very much, Ross. It's great to have this historical perspective to start off our conference about where we want to go from here with yes. our food supply. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, I, I uh, encourage anybody to... Uh, uh, d dig deeper into the history of agriculture in Newfoundland because there's a, a, quite a lot of, uh, written actually when you really search uh, about uh, the historical development of agriculture in this province and in Labrador.